Special coverage on KCPT of the Greater Kansas City Chamber's Big Five initiatives is funded by Burns & McDonnell. Pulsinelli. With additional financial support from Swope Community Enterprises. And by... Coming up, as Election Day nears, we'll spend some time in the lab talking translational research. Plus, a transitional time for the food stamp program. And how an opera is getting the June Kaneko treatment for its scenery. It's all ahead on The Local Show. Principal funding for The Local Show provided by Francis Family Foundation, Frederick and Louise Hartwig Family Fund, Kaufman Foundation, Healthcare Foundation of Greater Kansas City, Johnson County Community College, John and Effie Spees Memorial Trust, Bank of America Trustee, Richard J. Stern Foundation for the Arts, Commerce Bank Trustee, and KCPT members, thank you. I'm Randy Mason. Welcome to The Local Show. As you're probably aware, a half-cent sales tax on the November 5th ballot in Jackson County is asking voters to help fund translational medical research. It's an unusual tax in that it doesn't fund parks, public safety, or other things that are normally funded by sales taxes. On Friday's Week in Review, we'll spend the entire program debating the issue. One of the institutions that would benefit from the tax is UMKC, which would receive 20% of the take. KCPT healthcare reporter Todd Feedback visited UMKC to show you the kind of product that can result from translational research. Before we discuss the November 5th ballot issue, let's talk about cement or goo. It's billion dollar goo on my fingers right now, billion dollar goo. And Graduate student Rachel Weiler is showing us a new bone cement being developed by Dr. Linda Bonewald at UMKC. Each year, more than a million Americans undergo joint replacement surgeries such as hip, our knee replacements. And as our baby boom generation ages, that figure will increase dramatically. The potential market for a new cement is huge. Right now, it's dominated by a product that has been around for decades. They used to use it back in the 1940s. To, plastic surgeons used to uh, use it to fill uh, skull gaps. The, the cement system. is used uh, to attach an artificial uh, joint to, to existing bone as demonstrated that, here on a knee joint. The, uh, artificial knee components and plaster them down to the ends of the bone and anchor it with the help of bone cement. These bone cement are mixed on the back table by the scrub nurse. With only incremental changes being made to the cement that has been used for so long, it begs the question as to why a new product is even needed. The cement commonly used for these procedures damages the surrounding bone causing pain and requiring additional procedures. Uh, one of the major things is the exothermic reaction cement really has. It raises the temperature of the tissues to 82 to 86 degrees Fahrenheit, which is more than the critical temperature of denaturation of the proteins in the body. So even though cement becomes super hard and anchors the prosthesis down, it will also cause damage of the surrounding tissues. We are developing a new bone cement without these damaging side effects. This, it's actually not toxic to cells, and it may promote bone growth. We haven't been able to look, look at that, but bone cell growth. And so this would be really exciting because it'd be something that would actually replace something that's been on the market for 40 years. Whether this product will deliver as researchers hope it will remains to be seen. But the bone cement is just one example of taking research out of the lab and moving it to the patient, which is the very definition of translational research. So now, back to the decision that Jackson County voters are being asked to make on November 5th. The 20-year, one-half-cent sales tax would create an umbrella organization called the Institute for Translational Medicine of Jackson County, which would oversee the distribution of the tax proceeds. This tax will pay for medical researchers and their expenses, and if it passes, it will trigger a $75 million donation from Donald J. Hall and the Hall Family Foundation. This would pay for the construction of a building at Children's Mercy Hospital to house the Translational Medicine Institute of Jackson County. 
Opponents say that any tax increase would be better spent on public safety and other basic services. They also don't think that the $40 million a year the tax may raise is enough to really be a game changer, and that the institutes that support the tax should work harder to get funding from sources other than the taxpayers in one county. Lawrence Dreyfus is the Vice Chancellor for Research and Economic Development at UMKC and a proponent of the tax. It really is a transformative uh, moment in Kansas City. And uh, you know, it's extremely short-sighted to say uh, that an extra half-cent sales tax, uh, is, is it really worth it? I think you have to ask the question, uh, like it has been said, is it good for families? Is it good for the children? Is it good for uh, the, the health of our community? And in my estimation, the answer to all of those is yes, it's tremendously good. Backers of the tax say it will cost residents about $60 a year or $1,200 over the life of the measure. Voters will decide on Tuesday, November 5th, if they want to shell out that kind of money for translational research. Reporting for KCPT News, this is Todd Feeback. Remember, we'll dissect the research tax with proponents and opponents on Kansas City Week in Review tomorrow night at 7.30. Also tomorrow, life is going to get just a little bit harder for 47 million Americans. That's when an across-the-board increase in food stamp benefits goes away. That means a family of four will get $36 less a month. Now, it doesn't sound like much, but hunger experts say that $36 can buy 20 meals. Food stamps are now officially called SNAP, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. The name changed in 2008, and soon after, so did the politics. A traditionally bipartisan program turned into anything but. We sent KCPT special correspondent Sam Zeff out to see how all of this is playing out in Kansas and Missouri. It's amazing, really. All this food. Food is a basic need. And, and we should be able to f make sure that our citizens have access to nutritious food. All of it. We're a meat and potato store, as my father-in-law always said. We, we'll put a meal on the table. And people still don't have enough to eat. So there is a danger, in your view, that children in Kansas are going to go hungry? We already have a large number of kids in Kansas going hungry. I think the danger is that we'll have even more children in Kansas going hungry. SNAP is a $78 billion program which has more than doubled in the last five years. There are about 318,000 people in Kansas on food stamps. In Missouri, it's about 915,000. This has become a heated political debate in Washington and Jefferson City. In Topeka, there's a little extra heat. But for now, let's set politics aside. We'll come back to it. We have to. But for right now, let's go here. You need anything from down here? This is the HELP 317 Community Food Pantry on Parallel Parkway in KCK. They help feed about 90 families a week. Most are on food stamps, and most have someone who has a job. Since 2008, the pantry has struggled to keep up with demand, so they do what they can. Nobody leaves with that much food. A lot of dry box meals, canned sauces, um, canned fruits and vegetables, things that you can get cheap that are easy to make that you might not need or have, uh, you know, a, a full oven or stove to, to eat. All right, come with me. There's some more food back here. They have some freezers back here for additional items. Here they have some frozen vegetables, lots and lots of hot dogs. There's a second freezer that they have right over here. And everybody who comes in the food pantry gets one of everything. There's some ground beef. Here's something called turkey chubs. I'm not really sure what those are. And then they have one more freezer back here, and sometimes they'll have roast, sometimes they'll have chicken, sometimes they'll even have ice cream. But today, it's bare. It was really busy today. So what we know is that when government programs are cut, more people are going to try and come to the pantries, which are already stretched. Joanna Sebelin is chief resource officer at Harvester's Food Bank. It is a massive operation that serves hundreds of food pantries in 26 counties in Missouri and Kansas. Last year, Harvesters gave away 41 million pounds of food. It wasn't enough, and it's just getting harder. SNAP has already been cut, there are more cuts coming, and Kansas is leading the way. Ultimately, our goal 
for anyone um, is to be as self-sufficient as they are able to be. The way out of poverty isn't SNAP or food stamps, it's working. And that is what will ultimately help people. Phyllis so Gilmore is secretary of the Kansas Department of Children and Families. Over the past year, Kansas has been chipping away at SNAP benefits. Last January, the state changed the way it calculates income for parents who are illegal aliens, but whose children are citizens. That change cost an estimated 2,000 kids their benefits. Then, a few weeks ago, Gilmore announced a change in work rules. Able-bodied adults must go to school or work 20 hours a week to keep their food stamps. The SNAP benefits of 20,000 adults are in jeopardy. Nobody in the administration is talking about taking SNAP benefits away from, from children who deserve them, right? Nobody's talking about that. I don't know. I think when you, I think the question is, is it indirect or direct? I mean, perhaps we're not directly taking benefits away from children, but when we end outreach and families that don't typically rely on the system find themselves in hard times and can't connect with the benefit because they don't know it's there and these are families with children, that's really no different than taking the benefit away from the child. Shannon Katsaridis runs Kansas Action for Children and is among the harshest critics of how the state is changing food stamps. And it's that outreach part she just talked about that has those who help the poor most baffled. Gilmore and Governor Brownback decided to reject about $72,000 in matching federal grants that paid for outreach workers to help people sign up for food stamps. Grants, by the way, the state had accepted in the past and were already approved for the coming year. Gilmore says the state should not be using tax money to recruit people for welfare. And besides, she says, everyone already knows about SNAP. This is an application for benefits for someone who's applying that has a family. Oh, this is pretty lengthy. How long is this? 13? I think it's 13 pages. And, yeah. and is, this, uh, is this typical in, in most states? Uh, no, it varies pretty greatly. This is definitely a long one in comparison to most other states. Missouri is four pages. But even if people know about food stamps, the application process is complicated and daunting, which is why harvester outreach worker Shelley Paul is a crucial link in the chain. Not only were nonprofits baffled when the state turned down the outreach money, but they say the department cut them out of any discussions. This is an agency that has not been eager to engage stakeholders or advocates such as um, uh, myself in the dialogue. And so it's very difficult. There's not really legislative oversight around these changes. They are administrative changes that the agency has deemed to be in their purview. And you don't have a seat at the table when these discussions are happening? There are no discussions. We are very often finding out about these changes from families that are affected. There was no comment period for the public and that there was no discussion with them uh, before you or somebody in your office made this decision. But I think that is the way the decision is to be made, would be through discussion in our office, through the people who deal with the programs making recommendations ultimately to me. I don't know that it would have been appropriate to go out and ask for public input. And here's the other thing about food stamps. While they feed some people, they keep others employed. A lot of people lose their food stamps, and therefore we lose customers, and then we don't need our employees as much as, uh, as we do now. So then people will be out of work and, and be back out trying to find a job somewhere. O.J. Shipman owns Happy Foods North on Leavenworth Road in Kansas City, Kansas, a place where they still bag your groceries and carry them to the car. He says 35% of his business comes from people with SNAP cards. I think sometimes there's a, a, a misinterpretation of the people that use their SNAP card. I mean, it, it's people that are in need, basically. These are people who come in who have uh, uh, families, they have jobs, they just need a little help. Correct, correct. And if people in that part of KCK don't buy shipments food, they'll often get it for free at the Help 317 Community Pantry, where he makes regular donations. SNAP benefits are going to be cut more. We just don't know yet by how much. That's going to make it all the harder for the hundreds of pantries in Kansas and Missouri and the people who depend on them. So the idea that somehow people in need of food assistance is someplace else or somewhere else is wrong. It's flat out wrong. 
Um, but I think for many families, they're doing everything they can, um, doing all the right things, playing by the rules, and they still can't make ends meet. And I can't imagine what it must be like for a parent not to be able to feed their children. This week, a House Senate conference committee met for the first time to, among other things, talk about how much more to cut food stamp benefits. The Senate has proposed $4 billion in cuts, the House $40 billion. Also, Governor Jay Nixon said he wanted to change the work rules in Missouri, but he backtracked after an outcry from Democrats in the General Assembly. And finally, Harvesters says it'll continue its food stamp outreach program without the grant money turned down by Kansas. They plan to find the money somewhere else. When the Lyric Opera opens the curtain next week on their production of The Magic Flute, opera goers will get an unusually vivid visual treat. They'll see sets and costumes designed by the Omaha-based sculptor June Kaniko. It's a co-production with the San Francisco Opera Company, and our friends up at NET in Nebraska followed Kaniko's process all the way up to its Bay Area premiere. And not surprisingly, it is very cool stuff, and should get you revved up to see it here on stage at the Kauffman Center. Take a look. San Francisco, one of the most culturally sophisticated cities in the world, known for being on the cutting edge of creativity. Tonight, the San Francisco Opera is premiering a daring new production of Mozart's Magic Flute. Moments before the opening curtain, some of San Francisco's arts patrons gather for cocktails and mingle with a surprisingly large number of people from Nebraska. They flew in from Hastings just to wow. see, just, just for the opera. From Hastings? <laughs> the Nebraskans are all here because of one man, internationally renowned Omaha artist, June Kaneko. In Omaha, how to move them in and out. He designed the sets and costumes. I think this is overdoing it for the entire three-hour production. I really think it works. But despite the celebratory atmosphere, everyone involved in the production is on edge. Instead of regular stage sets, Kaneko is using 100% projected animation. Projection on this scale has never before been done in opera. Is that scary? Of course. Every time you're doing something that's new or different or unexpected, that it's incredibly frightening. We're nervous as hell. <laughs> I'm scared to death. <laughs> Just because of this, it's impossible. That doesn't mean it's you can't do it. If Kaneko is pushing the entire production team to the edge of what's possible, why are they still laughing? <laughs> I'm with you. The opera is like, oh my God, put on your seatbelt, here we go. Years of experience have given June Kaneko remarkable powers of concentration, the ability to empty his mind, stay in the moment, and focus entirely on his work. Kaneko came to California from Japan in 1962 when he was 21 years old. As a visual artist, he couldn't have picked a more dynamic time and place. In 1986, Kaneko moved permanently to Omaha after being one of the first artists in residence at the newly created Bemis Center for the Contemporary Arts. From Omaha, he continued building his growing international reputation, primarily in the ceramic arts, building the largest ceramic sculptures in the world. Today, after 50 years of living in America, and traveling the world, Kaneko is a cultural fusion of international aesthetics. But running through all his work, 
there remains an Asian influence. I think his intensity is probably very Japanese in his focus. I also believe a lot of the fact that he, he really deals with pure, simple form. I usually like to go as simple as possible. Kaneko is discovering that simplicity is elusive in Mozart's magic flute. The opera's many scene changes and profusion of characters has confounded stage designers for centuries. That was my first problem. How do I deal with this? You know, I, I can't make a good flow. I said, got to be a better way of doing it. <laughs> and then I thought about projection. Shocking everyone involved, Kaneko envisioned 156 minutes of animation on seven screens. The San Francisco Opera's director and production team decided to meet with Kaneko, not in San Francisco, but in Kaneko's studios in Omaha's Old Market, where the ambitious design is fully emerging. I think the principal risk that we take with this piece most of the audience will be expecting that there are going to be doors and walls and rocks and trees. We have absolutely nothing like that ever in the production. Once the projection logistics are worked out, the most difficult challenge becomes the animation. Inside Clark Creative, Fred Clark and Kevin Reiner are just beginning to understand the risks involved. There's front projections, yeah. there's rear projections, and in front of those front projections are actors crossing through that need to be lit. The animation is a live performance too. In the opera's very first scene, Kaneko has imagined swirling clouds that pose difficult challenges for animator Kevin Reiner. After the overture, this is the first thing you see, and there was a lot of, how are they gonna pull that off? Side. Yeah, yeah, they'll be, they'll be flown, just as they were in. In the Orpheum Theater, Opera yeah. Omaha is planning on presenting the Magic Flute and is sharing in the pre-production costs. But for Opera Omaha's managing director, Roger Weitz, There's seven projectors of these, you know. This isn't as safe as presenting an old, reliable opera. When times are bad, people tend to stick with what they know. So they go to the old Italian war horses and they bring out sets that are 30 years old and they dust them off and they put them up on stage because they know it'll sell tickets. But Kaneko's magic flute is anything but an old war horse. In my mind, the best way to energize this community, this audience, that's the question that all of us are facing, or how do we make ourselves relevant? What's so great about opera? Why is it important? And to me, this hit it on all on all marks. It's risky and it's adventurous to have such a fantastic, contemporary, bold design of a Mozart opera. After all the design elements are drafted in Omaha, June Kaneko and Re Kaneko, his wife and production manager, spend weeks in San Francisco working with the costume department, the props department, and the technicians operating the complex set of projectors. But after almost two years of being surrounded by borderline hysteria, even the normally calm Kaneko is beginning to get nervous. Everybody's watching, you know. It's a live music. Every performance is different. This is going to be a tough job. The opera is a classic fairy tale with a handsome prince who's attacked by a two-headed serpent. It includes an evil queen demanding wicked deeds and naturally has a damsel in distress. After the prince is given a magic flute, he rescues the fair maiden and they are reunited in Kaneko's brightly designed Temple of the Sun.
As the cast takes their bows, there is enthusiastic applause. But when Kaneko takes his bow, the entire audience rises to its feet. After two years of work, Kaneko has vowed to never do another opera. But if offered a major international production, will he be able to say no? No problem. The Magic Flute opens November 9th with performances through the 17th. There's also a June Kaneko solo show opening tomorrow in conjunction with First Fridays at the Sherry Leedy Gallery in the crossroads. And that is all the time we have this week. Remember, you can learn more about Kansas City's most interesting people, places, and performers at our website, thelocalshow.org. I'm Randy Mason. And I'm Nick Haynes. Thanks for watching. Happy Halloween. Principal funding for The Local Show provided by Francis Family Foundation, Frederick and Louise Hartwig Family Fund, Kaufman Foundation, Healthcare Foundation of Greater Kansas City, Johnson County Community College, John and Effie Spees Memorial Trust, Bank of America Trustee, Richard J. Stern Foundation for the Arts, Commerce Bank Trustee, and KCPT members, thank you. Special coverage on KCPT of the Greater Kansas City Chamber's Big Five initiatives is funded by Burns & McDonnell, Pulsinelli, with additional financial support from Swope Community Enterprises, and by...